Well, like Laura mentioned, it was just last summer on June 24th that the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. And one of the regrets that I have is that when, when Roe was overturned, that as a church, we didn't really take any time to talk about that or to celebrate that. I was very grateful to uh, Josh Neisler, who did the pastoral prayer the Sunday after Roe was overturned, because he did use a pretty big chunk of his prayer to praise God and to thank God that the Supreme Court had made the decision to protect human life, and I appreciate that. And so today, as we kick off this baby bottle campaign to help raise money for choices, I want to talk about Roe versus Wade and to celebrate its overturning. Also, I mentioned a few years ago that I wanted to spend at least one Sunday every year preaching on the sanctity of life because that topic is worthy of at least one Sunday a year, and today is the day. Now, before I talk about Roe versus Wade, let me give you a very brief history about abortion in the United States, because what many people do not know is that our nation for a long time was purely a pro-life nation. There was national agreement that every life, born and unborn, should be protected. In fact, by the year 1900, every state, every state in the United States had laws forbidding abortion at any point during a pregnancy. Even in the most liberal of states like California, you could not get an abortion. In New York, it was against the law. We were a pro-life nation from the lakes of Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee, across the plains of Texas, from sea to shining sea. Life was valued at every stage of development. But then, in the 1960s, things began to change drastically. And something you should know about the 1960s is that it was dominated by young people who were in rebellion as a whole, this baby boomer generation was much different than its parents. Because unlike their parents who had grown up with the hardships of the Great Depression and sacrifices of world, world War, the young people of the 1960s grew up during a time of rapid economic growth. And so this was a time when there was an explosion of young adults, many of whom were well-educated and privileged and they quickly deserted the values of their parents to seek out self-fulfillment. And so at no other time in American history had there been such a divide between generations. These boomers had been raised by the silent generation and the greatest generation. And these generations were known for their humility, their hard work, Christian values, integrity, and self-sacrifice. Meanwhile, the boomers during the 1960s were known for rebellion. Psychedelic drugs, casual sex, rock music, hippie communes, all became symbols of the distance separating these youth from their parents. You know, I always get annoyed when I see events like Woodstock being glorified and romanticized by today's media, when really Woodstock was just a sea of mud, sickness, sex, and drugs. I read this week that Richie Havens kicked off the musical performances of Woodstock with a song called Freedom. And a writer for the Gospel Coalition describes that song Freedom as Woodstock's call to worship, only God was not the object of their worship. Instead, freedom was to be worshiped. Freedom to be whoever, to sleep with whoever, to smoke whatever, to inject whatever, to do whatever feels real and authentic to you. And as we look back on the 1960s, we, we see this was the beginning of our nation going from a Christian nation to a post-Christian nation because it seems to be when these masses of educated, privileged young adults began to live out Romans chapter 1, 22 through 22, uh, 21 through 22. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. 
And by and large, they were not worshiping the God of their parents. They worshiped at a different altar. Ephesians 4.19 says, having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That verse describes the atmosphere of the ancient city of Ephesus, but it also describes the culture of the 1960s. Now, I was not around in the 1960s. I promise I wasn't. But I have read that that was the decade when the sexual revolution started in the United States. And this revolution promoted sexual freedom and free love. This movement sought to separate human sexuality from marriage and from consequences. And this rebellion was a tipping point in our nation because instead of leading to freedom, the sexual revolution has enslaved our society in sin. It's led to no-fault divorce, talked about that before, fatherless homes, abortion on demand, an explosion of drug abuse and sexually transmitted diseases, cohabitation, sexting, pornography addiction, an epidemic of homelessness, gay marriage, gender confusion, and a hookup culture. Free love is not free because sin always comes with a terrible price. And I think what's difficult in our day is that for many people living now, this lifestyle of free love is really all they know. And we live every day with the consequences of the rebellion and sins committed in the, in the past, and it has rippled and multiplied through the generations. There's a very important verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that I think should make everyone, uh, every one of us just stop and think. Because in this verse, the Apostle Paul describes our human tendency to compare ourselves with others. Verse 12 describes how people are only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as the standard of measurement. How ignorant, it says. And so when we use society at a large as our measurement for holiness, that is a very low bar. And it's ignorant to do that because it's common to measure ourselves with others. The New King, the New King James Version puts that verse this way, it says, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. And so we should never look to the world for our values and for our standards. Ephesians chapter 4, 20 through 24 tells us that knowing Christ should make us starkly different from the world. Since we have Learn the truth that comes from Jesus. We should throw off our old sinful nature and former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew our thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. And Ephesians chapter th uh, 5 verse 3 says that among Christians, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or impurity. So here's a question real quick. Does that describe you? Not a hint of dressing provocatively, not a hint of flirtation or suggestive touching, not a hint of inappropriate texting, not a hint of questionable internet searches or social media activity, not a hint of crude crude joking or sexual innuendo when you are with that close circle of friends? Is there not even a hint? Or are you measuring yourself with others? Well, while the world lives in free love to indulge sensual desires, the Christian disciplines desires because they are deceitful. Christians should be wise enough to know that sensual desires mislead by promising satisfaction, but instead produce guilt, disease, alienation, and a craving for more. So resist, resist the temptation to compare yourself to the world's standards because if you are a Christ follower, those are not your standards. Okay, so let's get back to picking on the 1960s. 
Boomers, it was your turn. Millennials have been picked on long enough, right? Now, what do you think happens? What do you think happens when you have a generational push for free love that seeks to separate marriage from sex and wants to have sex without consequences? Well, what you get is a society that suddenly wants to change its position on abortion. And so attitudes about abortion changed rapidly in America. And by 1971, half of Americans favored the freedom to choose abortion when the first trimester of pregnancy, within that first trimester. Within a year, that percentage went up to 64%. And of course, we all know that when public opinion changes, Many politicians suddenly evolve in their thinking. It's so annoying. It's like, oh, I was very morally opposed to that until opinion polls and focus groups told me that I should be for it. It happens now. It happened back then too. Well, those who favored abortion seized this moment and started filing all sorts of lawsuits to legalize abortion. And of course, the case that most of us know is the one that made its way all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, Roe versus Wade. And I think we all know a little bit about this case, but who was Roe and who was Wade? Well, Jane Roe was an alias or pseudonym for a woman named Norma McCorvey. And Norma McCorvey was a 21-year-old woman who had be become pregnant for a third time. She'd given up her first two children through adoption, but wanted to abort the third. But that was against Texas law. And so Norma McCorvey found two lawyers who were already actively seeking to make abortion legal. They just needed a plaintiff. And that plaintiff would be Norma McCorvey, AKA Jane Roe. And as a side note, the Wade of Roe versus Wade was Henry Wade, the district attorney who sought to enforce Texas abortion law. Now, do you ever wonder why people get so uptight about who is nominated to the Supreme Court? You know, why is there always such a fuss and such a fight? Uh, why do the nominees suddenly get accused of doing all sorts of terrible things and their names get dragged through the mud? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because the Supreme Court literally rules in matters pertaining to life and death. And there is a strong satanic force that longs for death. And on January 22nd, 1973, about 50 years ago, death was handed a huge victory when seven of the nine justices ruled in favor of Jane Roe. And then on the same day, that same Supreme Court ruled that a woman's right to abortion could not be limited by the state if abortion was sought for maternal health. Now, that doesn't sound so bad. Maternal health is important, right? Well, the problem is that the court went on to define maternal health as all factors, physical, emotional, psychological, familial, relevant to the well-being of the patient. And once you get past all that legal mumbo jumbo, it was clear that this liberal court had somehow through, great, through a great feat of mental and legal gymnastics interpreted our beloved constitution to say that abortion should be legal at any time and for any reason. Now, it doesn't take a law expert to know that our forefathers never intended for the United States Constitution to be weaponized against the unborn, the most vulnerable among us. James Madison is called the father of the Constitution, and he said this, we have staked the whole future of our new government, not upon the power of government, far from it. We have staked the future of all our political constitutions upon the capacity of each of ourselves to govern ourselves according to the moral principles of the Ten Commandments. Now, of course, amendments were made to that original constitution. And what many people don't know is that the justices that made abortion the law of the land did so by twisting the 14th Amendment. Now listen to what the 14th Amendment actually says. 
No state, no state shall make or shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Now, when I read that, I conclude, along with many other people, that the U.S. Supreme Court did exactly the opposite of what this amendment says. It's right there in black and white. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life. Why is that so hard to interpret? Science has confirmed that life begins at conception. We know that the being in the womb is a living human being, and it is a member of the human species. It is a person, and the state shall not deprive any person of life. Now, in the womb, it's a developing person, that's true, but it's still a human being right from the start because it's alive. It's growing, consuming food. It has its own DNA, often a different blood type than its mother's. And it's interesting that pro-abortion people really don't even argue the science anymore because they've lost the argument. With the help of 3D ultrasounds, everyone has clearly seen the proof of the living personhood of the unborn. There is no denying that. And what's also interesting is that the evidence provided from medical science is so strong that a very unlikely group has surfaced to oppose abortion. Atheist, some atheist. Elizabeth Cornwell, who was an executive director of the Richard Dawkins Foundation and an avowed atheist said this, there is a war on the womb. As a secular pro-lifer, I believe my case scientific, scientifically and philosophically sound. Science concedes that human life begins at fertilization. And it follows that abortion is ageism and discrimination against a member of our own species. Now, what's really sad, I think, about this quote is that some atheists are standing up for life at a time when Many Christians are compromising and cowering to the pro-abortionist. Entire Christian denominations now support abortion rights. The United Church of Christ, the Episcopal Church, the Presbyterian Church, even the United Methodists have become wishy-washy on this topic when the Bible is very, very clear about how God feels about human life both outside the womb and inside the womb. Now, before I go any further, I, I just want to pause and, and let you know that I do not mean to hurt anyone in here talking about abortion because I know that many young, terrified women have felt tremendous pressure from their own boyfriends, their own fathers, their own mothers to get an abortion. And I also know that many people believed the lie that Planned Parenthood reported for decades that a growing child in the womb is just a clump of cells. Many, many people have been deceived by Satan who wants us to live in a culture of death. He also wants us to live in a state of shame and unforgiveness. That's not what I want for any of you. And that's not what God wants for you either. John 3.17 says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now, at the same time, we have to talk about this. We do. It's an uncomfortable subject. I, I really dread preaching on this, but we have got to talk about this because we have young people who are coming up and they need to hear God's view on this. And the biblical truth is very clear, which is this. Scripture gives the same sacred value to an unborn baby as it does all other human life. Psalms 139, 13 through 16 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. 
when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. The Bible teaches that life in the womb is just as valuable as life outside the womb. It is just literally geography. Exodus 21, 22 through 23 says, if people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life. Life in the womb is sacred. I'll never forget hearing Mother Teresa back in 1994 speaking at the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C. In the audience that day were some of the nation's biggest abortion supporters, President Bill Clinton, First Lady Hillary Clinton, were squirming in their seats. But little Mother Teresa was not at all intimidated. She dared, to, she dared to clearly put into words what so many just did not have the courage to say. She said, if we accept that a mother can kill even her own child, how can we tell other people not to kill each other? She went on, by abortion, the father is told that he does not have to take any responsibility at all for the child he has brought into this world. So that father is likely putting other women into the same trouble. So abortion just leads to more abortion. Any country that accepts abortion is not teaching its people to love one another, but to use any violence to get what they want. This is why the greatest destroyer of love and peace is abortion. My wife, Megan, used to work for Choices. She's now a volunteer along with Paula Hart and Tabby Heron. Anybody else volunteer there? Well, when she was an employee there, they sent her to a conference, and she learned um, some heartbreaking facts. One, she learned that there are many church-going women who have gotten abortions because they convinced themselves that their church would judge them or shame them, gossip about them, maybe just flat-out reject them. One survey found that more than 4 in 10 women who have had abortions were church-goers. And that should not be. But I can kind of see why it is. Because I can remember a time not too long ago when churches questioned whether to throw a baby shower for a baby conceived out of wedlock. And of course, it would be terrible not to. Because every life should be celebrated. And when a young woman or a young couple is in that situation, that is the time to extend grace and to extend love and to celebrate that life. Now, another fact that Megan learned is that most women in an unplanned pregnancy are most influenced by two people, her own father and the father of her baby. Those two men will most strongly influence whether her baby will live or die. And that doesn't really surprise me either. Many of these young women have no money. They are emotionally fragile, alone, and they are scared to death to raise a child without the love and support of a father. And so when a father says, I'm in this with you, that will change everything. And so men, men in general, just need to talk, speak up on this subject. But unfortunately, men are often shouted down when they say anything against abortion. People use bullying slogans to shut us up. No uterus, no say. But the truth is, men would be the most influential if they would just speak for life. You ever wonder why Sisters for Life has their annual walk for life on Father's Day? It's because they know the power of men's influence. Now, you might be asking, why is Chris still talking about Roe versus Wade? You know, that's been overturned. Isn't that all over with? Well, Laura shared, no, it's not. When the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, it really just 
moved the legality of abortion to the states. And so now some states have outlawed abortion, while others still have no to little restrictions. In fact, some are promoting it. And so this is a spiritual battle that will continue to rage. And this is not the time to disengage. And honestly, this is the time for Christians to step up more than ever because for the last 50 years, we've been praying for the overturning of Roe versus Wade. And now Indiana has some very restrictive abortion laws, which means a lot more women will be having a lot more babies and they're gonna need a lot more love and a lot more support and a lot more resources. And so if you've never given to the baby bottle campaign, please do it this year. Choices has more clients than ever. And I also know that Choices in New Albany, they desperately, desperately need volunteers. It's only open one day a month and they will take anything that you can give them. And if you decide that you wanna help, Laura again will be out in the foyer. Now, there's one last closing thought for, for why we should never look down upon or, or judge anyone who has participated in abortion in the past because we are guilty too. We've all sinned. It was Martin Luther that pointed out that our sin nailed Jesus to the cross. He said, we carry the nails in our pockets. We deserved eternal death, but because of Jesus, we can have eternal life if you'll just receive him. And I invite you to do that this morning. But uh, let's sing, but first, let's pray. Why don't you all stand and we'll pray. Father, I just want to thank you for your word, the clarity that it gives in, in how we should live, what we should believe. It's all there if we would just read it and follow it. And Father, I thank you for, for the gift of life. We are all thankful for that, that you chose to create us in your image. And we pray, Father, for um, ministries like Choices that every day are on the front lines, fighting for life. And um, we just pray, Father, that you would give them all of the resources that they need, the volunteers, the money, everything that they need to accomplish their mission. I thank you for this church because I think it has a long history of standing up for the sanctity of life. And I'm thankful for men like Brother Sonny and Pastor Tibbs who really taught me a lot on that subject. And so... Um, we just pray, Father, that you will continue to bless us, bless our worship as we finish out our service, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.